the University of Johannesburg. The future reimagined. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a lovely day today. We're, we're having um, lovely sunshine after a very cold spell. And we're, we're starting off this Cloud Debate podcast series um, on, on different topics in, in the 4IR. Um, with me today, I've got Professor Namdi Nulu. He's a researcher, educationist, and engineer. Um, holds a BSc and MSc degree in electrical and electronic engineering and a PhD in electrical engineering, if I'm, I'm correct. So, yeah, very, very clever guy. I, I shy away from anything electronical um, after having shocked myself numerous times. Um, but, but, yeah, so, so welcome, Prof. It's, it's nice to meet you and to have you here. We're going to have a bit of a discussion on, on, um, on blockchain. Um, okay. well, thank you for having me. Um, good morning to you and the listeners. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps a, a small introduction about you. Um, Okay, um, like you said, uh, rightly said, my name is Namdi Umulu. I am um, a lecturer here at UJ in the Department of Electrical Engineering. And then um, my research basically um, has been in the um, mathematical modeling and machine learning space. And then um, recently we have begun to um, interface with emerging technologies right, um, in various engineering systems. And then that's um, what or that's led to my foray into the blockchain space. Um, so principally, we were looking at deploying blockchain technology for food traceability, right, which seeks to um, improve food security and um, food safety, right. Uh, so um, basically, what it entails is um, in the event that um, your food source is compromised able to go back and trace where um, the food has gone through along the value chain and perhaps where that contamination also also occurred. So that was my initial um, foray into the blockchain space, right? And then uh, we've been, um, we've, it's expanded essentially, right, to other areas, to other domain applications of blockchain, right? And then, um, yeah, so we we got um, a chair from Coronet, uh, which looks at blockchain applications in the African context. It's, and then I'm looking at various issues like um, food supply chain, like I mentioned, um, also um, voting systems, right, and then um, trade platforms. So basically, that's that's how I I, I got into um, blockchain related research. Yeah, oh, fast, yeah, fascinating. And um, I mean, food safety is such a big issue. We we had that big listeriosis scare a, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, that that was pre-COVID. I yeah. mean, yeah, certainly. <laughs> it seems certainly. like yeah. a whole different different world space that that we're living in now. Oh, yeah. yeah. But yeah. but uh, f food safety is is critical, and and as you rightly said, um, especially on the African continent. So so you see blockchain being used there, but but. If before we go into into the applications of blockchain, perhaps we, we should just have a discussion on what blockchain is exactly. I mean, I've, I've got many friends that, that's um, dabbling in, in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Yeah. Um, they've, they've made lots Some of money. money. They've yeah. lost, lost even, even more. more. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And um, yeah, I'm 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 not not smart enough to to go into that, but but driving into campus, I, I saw big billboards for Luno, um, which is a, a crypto Corners wallet. Exchange, yeah. yeah, and um, it it seems to be hotting up in in the African context. Yeah. But but what what is blockchain? Is it just Bitcoin, or is is there something else to it? Okay, no, um, that's a very good question, right? Because most people. Um, think of blockchain as being solely cryptocurrency, which is not really the case, right? So to properly understand what a blockchain is, I think um, I would like to talk about what a distributed ledger technology actually is because a blockchain is a type of a distributed ledger technology, right? So um, there are various, so all, all blockchains are DLTs, distributed ledger technologies, but not all DLTs are blockchains, right? It's a subtype of a DLT. So um, historically, um, when you had, um, if you think about your 
in the informal sector, for instance, in your spaza shop or your talk shop, right? And then you had um, folks that were doing some trading, right? And then the more conscientious ones would want to record, keep a record of um, the activities, right? Their inventory, um, the the trades they make, the revenue that accrues to them, right? And they would typically do it in a book, right? Which um, it's called a ledger, right? So you you have a ledger where you detail inventory, how much you've sold, who is owing you, how much payment has has occurred, and and the rest. So the ledger typically is used to record transactions, right? Okay. And, and then um, that has evolved obviously with the advent of um, digital technologies and the internet, as as other things. Other things also have evolved. Right? So you used to have um, an encyclopedia. You have Wikipedia now. You used to Perhaps send um, emails via the post office. Now you do that with an email. So now those um, ledgers have evolved and they now become digital. However, mm -hmm. even though they have evolved, right, um, the control is still centralized, right? So it's you have an individual that still maintains control of all the records, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then um, this now means now that. Um, Many parties, right, if you want to have access to those records, you have to go through that centralized authority. So now um, a decentralized or a distributed ledger technology, right, is leveraging technology to tweak that system, right, and changing it from control being vested only in the centralized authority, and um, you're now vesting control to every party in that network, right? So... Um, Every party in that network maintains the ledger. Every party in that network has access to the data that is there. And everybody agrees how and when we can put in information into that ledger and the kind of information that can be um, appended to that ledger. So that's what a blockchain essentially is. So it's a, initially, the two words were separate. It's a, it's a chain of blocks, right, where those blocks basically... Um, represent um, information records, right? And then it increases chronologically as and at when you add more information onto those blocks. And then, um, so typically, the principles that come to mind or the the, 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 the design principles that they, they, they use when coming up with the concept of, of blockchain are, are three is the decentralization principle, then um, it's also transparency and also immutability. There are others, but those are the three I, I typically use the acronym DTI to, to remember decentralization and transparency and immutability. So what it means is um, all the parties, um, control is not in one, like I said before, it's not in the hands of one central authority. And then um, secondly, there's transparency. So especially for instances where there is a lack of trust among the parties, everybody sees what is going on, there's transparency, and then there is immutability, meaning that um, once the block is appended to the chain, you cannot erase it. You can only go back. If there's now an error, you can only go back and um, insert a correction, but that original um, error st still stays there. Yeah. So that, that's, that those are the key um, design principles, if you like, um, for the blockchain. Now, um, mm -hmm. There are also, so for, for your blockchain to work, there are also um, some policies that have to be agreed, right? Agreed to by all um, the parties. The first would be um, the access policy, right? So all the nodes, all the parties um, that uh, in that blockchain have to agree would be able to read that information or have access, would be able to see those records. So that's the access policy one. And then you also have um, the control policy. So now the control policy now um, speaks to um, who or which member of the which, which nodes or which member of the blockchain can actually append information. Who can add information? Remember, those the first ones can just perhaps read, but now you have the second class that can actually append more information to the blockchain and increase it sequentially. So there needs to be an agreement. Who is it open to? to add that information. And then that's now when you now have various classes of blockchains, like um, public blockchains, um, 
private blockchains, um, permission blockchains, consortium blockchains, if it's between companies and the rest. That speaks to um, the control policy that they deploy. Right? Uh, and then um, the third one speaks to the consensus policy, right? the consensus algorithm. So meaning now that um, even though everybody can put in information to the blockchain, we must come to an agreement about the right way to get it done. Right? So we must come to an agreement about um, the consensus in case there is a dispute, right? What's the actual correct pattern of information that should be put in and how should it be done? So that's the consensus um, policy. So those three policies are also what um, every blockchain should have, right? And that determines the nature, right? And the type of that blockchain. Right? And then, yeah. I could go into the history, but I think that that, that will suffice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. So, so it's 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 interesting. So, so it's not just for money. It's it's for for yes. any anything yeah. basically Re- from contracts to um, make records, records uh, making, registries, yeah, medical yeah. records, Me- medical yeah. records. Yeah. I mean, exactly. that's that's something that that could also be really used in in the African context. Certainly. Um, if uh, if I may, I. I recently visited the hospital, the records department, yeah. and it, it was amazing how they could find anything because it's stacked files just everywhere. Yeah, yeah, and if yeah. you can have that on a blockchain, yeah. that, that might yeah. solve a lot, lot of problems. Um, and if, you were, if you went abroad, for instance, and God forbid, maybe there was an emergency, and then you might not be in a position to give them access to your records, but if it was on the blockchain, you know, and it's easily accessible to... Know, the medical practitioners say in another country or in another continent, yeah, right? yeah. it could possibly save lives too. Yeah, yeah, and and you say it's secure. I mean, if yes. if if um, if we're talking about medical records, I don't want a, a big company to gain access to yes. that. Yes, so yeah. so there is some security built in as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and then of course you could, like I said, each blockchain would come up with its own access policy. So maybe you might have a patient that might um, not want to give access to um, maybe a pharmacy or people that maybe uh, folks are excluding his primary healthcare practitioner, right? So you could maybe, if you're very privacy conscious, you could maybe um, define who you want to have access to your records. Another client might, another patient rather, might be more of, Lenient. I want everybody to have access to that. Yeah, exactly. So it it all depends on the access policy that is defined in that uh, in that setup. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's also interesting to me. You, you said that we agree. We need to to uh, put in place access control measures. We need to uh, come to a consensus. So so it means more than one computer, more than one individual on on the blockchain working together, which is a a very African concept. I mean, Ubuntu. Yeah, Ubuntu, yeah, it, yeah, it's, yeah it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we we could we could say that the blockchain is a, a digital form <laughs> of of Ubuntu. Uh, but but how do you see this this technology in Africa? Um, how how can we leverage blockchain in in an African context? Um, I think one of the key roles of blockchain um, is to one of the things it does, like I said, is the decentralized nature of of um, transactions, right? And then what that does is it removes intermediaries, it removes middlemen, right? And then it makes um, processes faster than they would have been um, otherwise. So now and in Africa, we have um, a lot of cases where we have intermediaries, right, um, that are not efficient, right? It might be that they are not just efficient, and sometimes it might be that they have um, pecuniary reasons why they should not be <laughs> efficient, <Yeah. laughs> like corruption and the rest, right? So um, with the advent of um, blockchain, of blockchain technology, it can eliminate because um, it's, a, it's a peer-to-peer mechanism. There's no central authority. There can be interactions um, that are transparent, removing the need for intermediaries. So um, an example would be um, the issue of elections. For instance, right, um, voting who comes to power, you know, all across the African continent, you have issues about 
election integrity mm. in Tunisia. And, and they vote because typically it's done in some cases manually without electronic systems. And even when it's done with electronic systems, there are still issues that have to do with fraud and the rest. So deploying a blockchain solution in that space would strengthen our, I believe, the democratic or the democratic experiment on the African continent, right? Um, bringing about really um, free and fair elections, right? So you could, that's a prime example, I think, of um, of a blockchain application in the in the African con- uh, continent. Although, I mean, whether we are ready for it is another question entirely, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then um, allied to that also um, has to do with um, the issue of procurement, right? Procurement and contracts, right? That's another mm-hmm. area where, I mean, Africa, it would benefit from transparency, right? Where everybody knows mm-hmm. what are the um, terms, what are the requirements of the contract, who are those that um, are able to, Get it done. What are their what's their pedigree, you know, and the rest. What are their bids, you know? It's an open system. Um, procurement would um, also, in my view, significantly benefit from um, the deployment of blockchain. It will also perhaps um, bring down the cost of some of the projects that um, go on in Africa that are overly priced because you have lots of middlemen that are taking yeah. their own uh, their own cut from it, right? Um, another area that would benefit from the deployment of blockchain technology would be in the area of um, identity management, right? Issues like records. Um, So you, we're all aware, we all know people that have had their um, data from home affairs compromised, right? Or Mm. people use that data to get access um, um, loans and the rest without their knowledge, compromised records, right? Identity management is an issue. Right. Uh, not just in South Africa. I can give examples elsewhere. Um, so um, should blockchain be leveraged in that space, right? it would um, make it better for there to be real integrity in that space and prevent, mitigate issues of um, fraud and um, identity theft yes, yes. and the rest, right? And then um, you also have other areas like um, I've mentioned before, food supply traceability, safety, um, also the area of um, academic records, right, um, which is, we all know, even in the South African context, various people that have occupied sensitive positions claim they had certain degrees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then um, uh, credential for fraud is an issue, and you see a couple of, I think I saw some data that um, some countries in Europe spend a significant amount of money trying to verify you know, records and trying to mitigate or combat um, misrepresentation in that space, right? So leveraging um, blockchain technology would um, would be a very um, pivotal role. Uh, blockchain can play a very pivotal role in uh, mitigating issues of fraud um, in that space. So there are um, also in the area of um, energy trading. So um, <clears throat> you would... I agree with me that um, all across Africa there are issues with um, energy. And then um, what I feel is the solution is that um, we have to also move towards the having microgrids because the main grid actually is not really working. And if you check in order when Africa had a connection problem in the area of um, telephony, right, uh, landlines not really working and when mobile telephones came which was sort of distributed right it was able to bridge the telephony telephone access gap across mm-hmm. africa i believe that the same thing is also required in the energy space right um the central um big electric utilities doesn't seem to work in, in many african states yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there is the need to um move to the realm of microgrids Right, smaller energy generators, embedded generators, and the rest. So now that raises issues in terms of transactions, payments, and the rest. So um, blockchain, which is also a decentralized system, can also find can also ease the adoption and also sort out some of the transactions in peer to peer energy trading. Yeah, yeah. All right, and then we have done. Um, I and a couple of my students, we've done a lot of we've published 
some papers in that that regard how to um, various uh, looking at various energy setups and how to um, facilitate payment and exchange of energy within various um, players in that space. So that's also another play, another area where um, blockchain can can also play a very pivotal role. Yeah. And then finally, I also I would also think about um, in the area of um, um, mitigating counterfeit um, products. So um, across Africa, um, maybe not as it's not very it's not predominant in South Africa, but in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, there are issues that have to do with um, fake drugs, right? Uh, so people, um, unscrupulous elements um, get fake drugs and people die, uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. of all these um, drugs. So a blockchain system that would um, prove the authenticity. Right of some of these projects, right would also um, would also find um, practical deployment in the African context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it sounds all very far away, but yeah. in in reality, we are busy implementing these these uh, the blockchain already. I mean, UJ has now implemented it with our yeah. our graduates' yeah. um, exactly. c- certificates, yeah. which is uh, I, f- I think it's one of the first universities certainly. to do it in certainly. in uh, Africa. Yeah, certainly. And I, I also read that uh, our our license, um, our, our driving licenses, okay. that's also going to be on a blockchain now in in the South African context. Um, I, I'm hoping that it is going to happen. We'll yeah. we'll have to see. the The article mentioned that it's going to be in 20, uh, 23, Okay. Uh, okay. Once, once the new machines come, so so okay. that that would be excellent because then, yeah, then we, we cannot have drivers on on the roads without a, a valid license. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that, that that's very interesting. And and in terms of of education space, um, is is there anything else except for um academic records that that one can use this technology? In? Um, yeah, I think um academic records is is the predominant application, yeah. right? Um, in the in the in the educational space, like you and like you rightly mentioned, UJ is a pioneer in that space. So um, UJ um, students can share. Um, some of their, their details with employers and the rest, and then to prove the authenticity of their qualifications and the rest. And then, um, but we must also understand now that um, um, most folks are now life. There's now the concept of lifelong learning, yeah, right? Yeah. In in most cases, um, people will still go on to get maybe not major um, degrees, but um, certificates. Um, Micro credentials, right? Um, apprenticeships, apprenticeships, and then um, digital certificates and the rest. So, um, the concept can also be extended away from the um, HEIs, higher education institutions like UG, to other um, the informal sector, for instance, right? Um, skill acquisition centers, right? Um, at the at, at the much more at the lower levels, it can also um, play a role there. Right, so if, for instance, you you claim you have a certain skill that might not necessarily stem from the um, educational um, space, how does how do other people verify that you really have that skill set? Yeah, right, yeah. Or, or how do you get um, referees, you know, to attest to that um, skill set? So you could have that um, on the blockchain at a much more informal level, and that would also be helpful. And then um, basically, um, even in the education space, apart from um, Credentials, you still have a lot of data that is shared across most of the players in the educational ecosystem, right? So the credential one is between the student and then um, the university and then employers, but then even amongst universities, mm. amongst um, accreditation bodies, right? Um, amongst I know, I know we deal with a lot of paperwork <laughs> that <Yeah. laughs> too much, yeah, too much that. Um, <laughs> Ever so often um, gets uh, missing, or you, you know, you you, you lose it, you know. So um, you can also benefit from the adoption of um, blockchain technology, mm. right? To accreditation is a big issue. We always see about EXA, you know, and the rest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's the Engineering Council of South Africa. So how can we? Blockchain can also be deployed in systems that require data across yeah, yeah. across I- players in the ecosystem. And then um, we could also um, um, use blockchains because blockchains 
one of their key components is um, is what is called a smart contract. All right, so a smart contract basically is um, eliminating um, the human involvement in processes, right? So instead of if maybe there's a process that involves lots of actors, right, and it follows a process, uh, follows various stages, right, automating that process and eliminating the bottleneck. So an example is maybe if you reg- you buy your house and you're registering it mm-hmm. in the deeds office, you know, it involves your lawyer, it involves the estate agent, so many people. Automating that process will eliminate all those intermediaries and make it... Um, and make it faster. Yeah, yeah. You, you might, in the educational space, where you have lots of um, intermediaries, um, if you deploy the blockchain in that space, you might see now that um, there are improved outcomes, right? Um, learning can be faster, and they, they yeah, can yeah. be better that way. Yeah, yeah I mean, if, if your personal information is on a blockchain, mm. and, and you apply to the university, mm-hmm. that, that application process can also become much easier yeah, to, yeah. to process from... Yeah. From a university side of you, but but also from um, a, a student side of you, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. it can basically help all the various um, players in the ecosystem, in the educational, the educational ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I remember what I was trying to say, and then when I what I was talking about the smart contract is conceivably, you could use um, a smart contract to automate the marking process. Right, you could automate. That, that sounds <laughs> excellent. You could, you could consider you could use the smart contract to automate the marking process and then the grading. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the grading, for, especially for things that are clearly objective. So a smart contract would not work in instances where um, there's some subjectivity. What is the computer code? Yeah, right. Yeah. So if maybe you have to um, consider various extenuating circumstances and make a decision. So a smart contract would not be suitable there. But if it's a case where it's purely objective, you either have obtained it or you haven't, mm. then you could conceivably use um, a smart contract. The whole process is um, transparent yeah, yeah. to all students, right, and to the staff and everybody. And then there's – because you have a lot of feedback from students. You know, I wasn't marked properly, you know, but that yes. process is – it can be automated. A student can submit and then um, the smart contract just runs it and then he or she knows – it's great, and then um, everybody is so is happy, right? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, this uh, reminds me of a series I watched a, a while ago, okay. British co- comedy stand-up show. Okay. Um, and and they had this one lady that would book tours, and she would type away on on a computer. If someone comes with an answer uh, with a question, type away with the on on a computer. Okay. Look at the screen, and then just say, "Computer says no." Okay. And, and that, that was the whole catch line. Yeah, yeah. It says no. no, yeah. So, so when you would have to fight with a computer to <laughs> to convince her otherwise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but um, w- would governments go for for this? I mean, yeah, that's a that's a very uh, that's a very um, good question, a good point, right? Um, in terms of, for instance, in the area of procurement, where you have vested okay. interest, yeah, you might maybe see some reluctance. On the path of um, government, government, government players, right, to adopt these technologies. But uh, by and large, I think um, that they would have to come on board sooner. Yeah, yeah. Later. So, yeah. so that political will needs yeah, to be there. Yeah, that yeah. political will needs to be there. But I do not necessarily think that they have a choice. Yeah. Uh, with yeah. time, um, so now you have um, several um, several countries coming up with digital currencies, right, and tying it to stable coins in the cryptocurrency realm, you know. And then um, governments are looking a bit more in the cryptocurrency space and trying to consider it how to how it can um, ease payments, right, and basically um, get a lot of people more into the formal economy because the way um, the current systems work, you typically need an ID, typically need a lot of documentation to um, be in the formal economy. But mm. now I'm with in the crypto space. You just need a phone. You, know, you have access to some of like your friends that um, you mentioned. Yeah, that yeah. Dealing with um, um, Luno and the rest, right? So it, it has the potential to bring in a lot of people that he that were excluded from the formal economy into, into the formal economy. Yeah, yeah. Now that, that sounds, it, it, it sounds so optimistic. Um, yeah. <laughs> which, which is 
Good, which is something that's much needed. I mean, we've been through through two years that has yeah. quite been quite interesting, and and having that that hope for yeah. a better future and, and this technology building a better future for for us, and um, that 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 makes me optimistic. That makes me excited. If if I want to get involved in in blockchain, um, how how would you suggest I, I get involved in it? Um, uh, if, if say say for instance I'm from um, I'm just finishing high school and I want to to get involved in blockchain because I believe this is a technology that's going to give me a job one day that that's going to be give me a lot of um, uh, financial security. How how would you suggest getting involved? Um, there is a need on the African continent to expose a lot more of um, our youth right to the technology. Mm. Right, um, because um, it really is the future, and then um, if it's not properly harnessed, as um, our VC often um, talks about, it can also exacerbate the issue of a digital divide. Yes, yes. Uh, so, um, if I were, if you want to get into, blockchain, of course, you could get into cryptocurrency. So you have lots of Africans already that uh, yeah, I get are in this cryptocurrency space, and then um. They hedge their bets on um, the rise of um, certain coins, you know, and then um, make make some money, right? That's the cryptocurrency space, mm. right? But, but then you could also um, get into um, other areas. Blockchain has um, impacts on the since it's a new field. There's there there, 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 there are going to be legal implications, right? So, for instance, um, digital assets. Um, there are going to be legal questions that. Um, Needs to be sorted out, right? If you're going to be sequestrated, for instance, mm. but and you have digital assets that are not necessarily um, in your bank account or they're not tangible assets, yeah, yeah. how should they be handled, for instance? That, that's a very good question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so that, that so there, there, there's there's need for people to answer those legal questions, mm. right? There are regulatory issues, right? With um, with blockchain technology, right? And then uh, governments typically want to encourage innovation, right? Because blockchain has the potential, like I said earlier on, to bring in people into the formal economy, right? And unlock economic opportunities. At the same time, because of the pseudo-anonymous nature of the technology, um, it's also, um, it can also be taken advantage by um Folks for maybe money laundering, for maybe terrorism financing, and the rest. Yeah, right? yeah. So government has to find the balance um, in that space. So um, there, 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 there's still there's still the need for the people to experience the technology and come up with viewpoints to shaping how the regulators um, go forward with the, the technology. And then of course in the in in the application space, right? Um, we talked about various areas where blockchain can find applications, right? And then um, we need um, young people um, with ideas, um, with um, young people that understand their own peculiar circumstances that would leverage the technology to to solve societal problems, right? Um, I often say that um, we have a job problem in in, in Africa. Mm-hmm. We, we, have, we should be creating about 15 million jobs per annum and we create only about under 3 million. Yeah, yeah. Right. So um, there is need for entrepreneurs in this space that can um, unlock the technology and then um, unlock economic benefit for, 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 for the majority of us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and having these smaller businesses, they, they employ a lot of people. Yes. If, if you start with, with a, a small business and, yeah. and you build your way up, mm-hmm. you, you take a, log, a lot of people along with you on, on that journey and exactly. give them, them work. Yeah. Um, and, and many of those will leave and start their own, own companies. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so really, from, from the ground up, I, I believe small and medium uh, inter- enterprises, that, that's the way to go. Certainly, certainly. Yeah. That's how China was able to bring out, push people from um, poverty up onto the middle class. Yes, yeah. yes. Certainly. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And it, it was done in, in a matter of 50, 50 years. years. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so if you if you take that into account, I mean, Rwanda is an, another case of of a country that's really building itself up very yeah. quickly yeah. following the 1994 massacre. Yeah. Um, uh, there, there is the hope. Yeah. That, that's that's yeah. the big yeah. thing. We yeah. just need people with with a will to yeah. to start yeah. changing yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in in terms of programming languages, uh, what what would you suggest someone um, study uh, or get involved in? So there are, uh, it depends on the if you're doing if you're working on the in terms of smart contracts, right? I would say that you Solidity is your is your best friend. Okay. <laughs> so you need to you need to learn Solidity, right? And then um and we have a couple of um some of my students, a couple of us have um a couple of my students are and there's there are a lot of resources online, right, yeah. to 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 gain um to gain expertise in Solidity, right, and then um, if you, and that's good for public blockchains, okay. right? Solidity, right, smart contracts, um, DeFi and the rest. Solidity is, is um, the language of choice, and then um, if you go to what um, private blockchains, typically um, Hyperledger, okay. Hyperledger Fabric, and then um, you would need um, languages like Golang, right, um, Node.js, right, and then those are the languages um, that um typically deployed in, in that space, yeah, right? Okay. And then there are a host of others, yes, yes. right? Um, and the, the the tech space is a rapidly evolving <laughs> space. Way, way too fast. Yeah, uh, so you even have uh, now um, some programs that um, they give you snippets. You want to achieve something, it just gets you a snippet of the code. You don't yeah, necessarily yeah. need to write it out in, um, in code any longer. So, yeah, but... For for coding, yeah, I would say start with Solidity, start with um, Golang, um, for public blockchains and for private blockchains, and then um, you progress as you go along. Yeah, yeah. So so there you have it. You, you can go onto YouTube or or the internet on Google and go and have a look at those languages if you want to. I also know that I think the IIS is also um they also UG is also working on a couple of those. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so so. Trainings, with practical trainings in that space. Yeah. Practical trainings. We've we've got short learning programs on blockchain yeah. development at, at UJ, which yeah. is uh, available for people interested in in this field. Um, so so yeah, no, there's there's many opportunities. It, it just goes. You need to go and out and find these opportunities yeah. and, and and go for it. Uh, I, I I think we we've covered quite quite a lot of. What blockchain is, and I, I know there's there's so much more to to be yeah. said about it, um, but but yeah, are, are people? Um, uh, uh, is it possible to contact you? Can we share your your email address? Yeah, uh, sure. Well, my uh, email address is double n w u l u at u j dot ac dot Excellent. So if you're interested in blockchain, you you can contact uh, Prof Nandi, and um, yeah. Uh, perhaps if you are um, a, a graduate that's looking for a postgraduate opportunity, um, we we can certainly discuss certainly. What, what what is yeah. what is available and how we we can get be more people involved in this. Yeah, certainly. certainly, that was fascinating. Thanks, thanks so much, Prof. Um, I I understand a bit more about blockchain <laughs> a now. A bit more, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's difficult to understand it completely in I, I, over yeah. a thirty minutes discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but um, I, I think. I think there's there's so much new technologies coming out, and it, it's such an exciting time to be alive in. Um, but but I really thank you for your time. It, yeah. It's been wonderful meeting with you. Thank you and kindly for having me. Yeah, and I thank look, you to the team for organizing. And I look forward to to having you again soon. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you kindly. Yeah. Right. Well, that's it for yeah. our first podcast um, on on the cloud debates. Uh, we, we thank you for listening and, and tune in sh- soon uh, when we start discussing the metaverse and, and the applications there of in an African context. The University of Johannesburg. The future reimagined.